the Triathlon Show. You're in 53. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I republish an interview that I did for the Endurance Innovation Podcast with uh, friends of the show, Michael Lieberson and Andrew Buckroll. You should go and check them out so you can just search Endurance Innovation in your podcast app or go to x3training.com and click through to the podcast uh, tab in the menu bar. So the interview is about devices, apps, tools, and technology that help, and uh, to some extent, those that hinder triathletes and endurance athletes in training and racing. So I hope you'll find it interesting. Uh, I think it is an important topic, which is why I choose to republish it. And this is with permission, of course. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, as many people as possible get to hear it. So even though I know that probably quite a few of you have already heard this interview, I that's the basically the reasoning for republishing it on that triathlon show uh, even though it was already on the endurance innovation podcast a month or so ago but before we get into the interview big thanks to our sponsors first we have precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com electrolyte replenishment can be an important factor for performance and the importance of this gets greater if you are somebody with generally a high sweat rate because then you'll lose more electrolytes as well or you are somebody that have that has a high sweat sodium concentration and if you combine the two then obviously that's the the worst and also another thing that has a great impact is if you're training or racing in hot and humid environments and finally when races get longer or training days get longer then this also gets exacerbated so uh, there are many things to factor in when it comes to to hydration and and i think that the best place to learn is to go and listen to some of the uh, interviews i've done with andy blow you can just go to scientifictravel.com and put in andy blow in the search bar and his episodes will pop right up or you can go and check out precision hydration's blog where they have some pinned articles that are great places to start you can get 15% off your order of electrolyte products with the promo code that triathlon show one five. And thank you to Roka. Roka is uh, one of the most innovative uh, companies in the endurance sports industry. They have uh, launched technologies such as the arms up technology available in all of their wetsuits and in their tri suits. They have the exoskeleton, which is new for the Maverick X2, which uh, maximizes how much uh, you can engage the core in your swimming. They have the Geco anti-slip technology on all of their glasses to make them impossible to shake off your face. And many, many other uh, really innovative technologies that they've brought to the market in their different product lines and categories. Check out their wetsuits, dry suits, swim skin, goggles, and high-performance eyewear and prescription glasses and sunglasses on roca.com. And get 20% off your order with a promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview republished from the Endurance Innovation Podcast with myself and Michael Lieberson and Andrew Buckrow. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Endurance Innovation. Joining Andrew and myself today is uh, Michael Erickson, friend of the show, uh, his second appearance on Endurance Innovation. And uh, for those of you who don't know Michael, he uh, operates Scientific Triathlon, which is a website um, and, a, and a coaching um, a coaching outfit. And he also uh, records and produces the excellent That Triathlon Show podcast, which uh, <laughs> has been an inspiration for for several of our episodes, to be perfectly honest. And uh, on more than one occasion, I've uh, I've referenced one of his episodes in answers or you know thoughts that I give on on our show as as explanations for why I think the way I do. So, Michael, um, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for coming back on. Thanks, Michael. It's uh, great to be back. And uh, yeah, I'm a loyal listener of your your show. And uh, whenever I hear the that triathlon show mentioned on on your podcast, it uh, it does feel <laughs> nice. I get a warm fuzzy feeling inside that uh, that uh, podcast <laughs> is of some use to somebody. 
Oh, 100%. 100%. So uh, the reason that we had Michael on today, it was um, a topic that uh, Andrew and I've uh, kicked around a little bit mm -hmm. tangentially on our podcast. Um, when we've talked to specifically experts in the sensor space, so you know, folks making aerometers, um, or when we've talked to coaches like Tilbury Davis, um, or, you know, my, um, Marco Altini of HRV for training when basically we've talked about devices or, or systems or, or, you know, programs that are intended to make your training experience more worthwhile or, or more targeted or better in some capacity. So as, uh, as listeners to our show, you guys will appreciate the fact that Andrew and I are both very big fans of technology and we have a lot of positive things to say about all the, you know, the gadgets and the, the apps that are out there. Um, but it's, it's worth mentioning. And I, I've been saying this quite a bit lately. It's worth mentioning that there are some of these things come with caveats in that, you know, caution should be taken in interpreting some of the results uh, and some of the the feedback from these devices and these programs. And um, this is why I wanted Michael to come on the show so that we can uh, get his, uh, you know, his opinion as a coach and also as someone who is very well grounded in evidence based uh, um, coaching and training. And the one thing I might add to that as well is just looking at the historic perspective, uh, there was a time when there was really no data available. You'd take a journal and record your thoughts after a workout, and that would be that would be your data. Um, and it's hard for, for me to imagine going back to that right now because everything I do is so technology and data centric. But there were obviously some very successful athletes, but we've continued to see performances go up. And maybe a question I have that's more of an open-ended question would be, uh, is the reason that we're seeing these performances at the Olympic level, at the professional athlete level, um, is the reason we're seeing this, this improvement because of technology or is it uh, just people are getting better or we're getting a larger number of people involved in the sport and therefore the chances of having that exceptional athlete will continue to increase? Yeah, I think that that's a great, uh, great question to have. And uh, yeah, I can't give an answer, but I think we have some examples of where performances have actually not improved in a long, long time. I'm thinking of, for example, the, the Hawaii Ironman marathon record, which stood from 1989 or something until Patrick Lange broke it. So for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, despite the fact that triathlon has become so much bigger than it was back then. So, but, but generally, I mean, yes, uh, performances are going up. There is plenty of good uh, published data as well for marathon running and the, the world record development in marathon running. And uh, I think probably the data helps coaches in particular learn how to coach better. And that then trickles down to the athletes. That's one aspect that I think is really important with how data helps. It's not so much that the athletes can see exactly how fast they're running their intervals. It's more so that the coaches learn when we do these sorts of intervals, the, the athlete seems to improve. And uh, and then that's how the training becomes more and more effective over years of, uh, of trial and error, essentially. Oh, that's a really interesting take. So it's so if I understand correctly, you're saying that it's not the the access to the data on, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the access to the data by, you know, sports scientists and, and high level coaches and the like that can then make smarter coaching decisions. Is that what you're Absolutely. thinking? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would 100% uh, say so because you can go and do, let's say you want to go and do a bike workout and you want to do a VO2 interval workout, you're going to do six times three minutes and you can find a nice hill that you can climb up in three minutes mm. uh, and or maybe a little bit more. And basically, you can do an extremely good workout by just pushing hard for three minutes. And of course, it requires a little bit of experience to know how hard you can push so you don't fall apart. <laughs> but really, it, it's not that difficult. You, you don't need to know exactly what your power was to know if it was a good workout. You can you can kind of feel it when you're uh, uh, like even half experienced athlete. But uh, the uh, the main benefit i think is that we are able to measure things at a sports science level and at a coaching level and of course it is also a benefit for the athletes to have the data and be be able to to maybe get those extra 10 percent out of the workout by being a little bit more effective in pacing and so on but but i think the big the big thing really is that sports science has moved forward so much and and coaching has moved forward so much hmm that's a really interesting point. And when we were uh, in before we started recording formally, uh, Michael, you were saying that um, you, you feel that 
the conversation we're going to have today um, will target it more. Our thoughts will be targeted more towards the self-coached athletes rather than the coached athletes. And it sounds like this is why, because there is um, a, a different lens that that those two groups of of practitioners or or participants are going to look at this uh, at this data. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, in training, this is something that you've talked about uh, many times. Uh, the minimal effective dose of training yep. and i think this can apply in some way to the use of technology as well in in training like what are the things that you really need and want to to make your training the most effective but then at some point when you start adding more and more things then chances are you you might actually be in some ways diluting the the effectiveness of your training or at least you risk in you risk incurring like confounding factor factors there that make it make it more difficult for you to execute your training well rather than uh rather than uh, than less difficult Agreed. so so i think that that's a, an, a, good, a good perspective for the self-coach athlete to have that it's not that you need every single piece of technology it's figuring out what are the right ones to have that will give you really the the most benefit I guess it's very much a case of paralysis by analysis. If you have too much available, you may be overanalyzing and just not not working effectively because you have access to all this information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you may be paying attention to the wrong things, right? You may be paying attention that are very marginal and and overlooking things that are really quite important. And I I see this a lot with athletes that they're really kind of really focused on the on the wrong thing that they're they're and I can cite lots of examples of this but they're they're not paying attention to the right stuff they're they're thinking more about things that are not going to at the end of the day make them better and that's part of what what we're going to talk about today guys so why don't we jump in and Michael for the sake of structuring this uh, this conversation um, why don't we go from things that in your opinion, um, have, you know, or by things, I mean, either devices or, or sensors or, um, apps, whether it be web or, or mobile that in your opinion are the most useful and have the greatest evidence for, for that efficacy. And then we'll work towards ones that are, you know, maybes and then towards ones that maybe you or I or Andrew think are, are actually harmful. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, the the most important ones in my opinion are pretty evident really they are the power meter heart rate monitor and the gps watch or and maybe by computer as well you can lump in there but sure. basically devices that allow you to measure your power on the bike your heart rate on the bike and the run and your speed on the on the run and uh, and the yeah, potentially even your uh, your splits in the pool although you could just use a good old-fashioned pace clock <laughs> on the wall for for that as well so yeah measuring uh, b- being able to measure pace in the swim pace on the run heart rate on the run and power on the bike and heart rate on the bike though those would be the devices that i think are absolutely like really really important and good and beneficial if you can do all those and maybe setting aside the pool for now um during a race it's extremely difficult to get any kind of feedback on how that particular pace is going so if you if you need to educate yourself based on this is my pace by checking every 25 meters what your uh, your time is then you need to work on some self-pacing i think yeah. because you're never going to have that feedback when you're swimming it's impossible to look at a watch yeah and, and the same goes for all the other disciplines as well because technology technology isn't uh, isn't foolproof uh you can run out of battery mm-hmm. something can happen the gps signal is really wonky in some places and uh, many things really can go wrong with that so so you need to be able to pace without really relying on technology as well but uh, that technology can still be useful and when i'm when i'm saying that these are beneficial i would actually say that they are mostly really beneficial in training uh, of course race i'm not saying that they're not useful in racing but i think in many races at least up to, up to the half distance it it is often quite like many athletes actually might even benefit from from pacing or at least learning to pace more on rpe rather than mm-hmm. having a preconceived notion of what sort of pace or power they want to be holding so so i think that racing yeah you can you can use them absolutely but the big benefit really is is to plan and execute your training and then analyze your training a little bit to see how things are going. How are you progressing? That's where I see that these devices really come into their own. Yeah, I, I really like that answer because I think, um, you know, if we're, if we're getting back to basics on on the the important kind of variables of training are, are frequency, duration, and intensity. And uh, with a GPS watch or by computer, you're getting 
you know, you're getting the duration piece. The, the, the frequency is really straightforward. That's, that's just a calendar. Um, but the intensity one is the, the intensity component is really the most tricky one, uh, to capture. And, uh, as you mentioned, you know, pace for running, swimming, power, heart rate on the run. Um, power on the bike, heart rate on the bike. Those are those are the ways for us as, as both coaches and self coach athletes really to capture that intensity piece, which otherwise would would go you know otherwise you'd have to use RPE and RPE is kind of a sticky metric because it's um, you know it's uh, it, it, it it's affected by so many so many things and uh, I I don't disagree with you that it's a really valuable tool for athletes to learn to pace especially shorter races on effort and I agree that there's some there's some wins there for sure but. Uh, yeah, for the longer stuff, I would say, you know, even even using these devices for racing and and relying on them, but having a backup plan because um, you know the one Ironman I, I did my my um, uh, my power meter just would not connect, <laughs> so it, that became a, a you know there was a a plan B in place fortunately for that, um, so, but uh, I am still a fan of using them for for longer races as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, I am too. Uh, I just think that athletes need to learn to to deal without them when those things happen as uh, you just show, showed that yeah these things do happen yeah absolutely and they're getting they're better now than they used to be but the you know i remember racing in with with first second generation of these sensors especially power meters uh and they were a nightmare like they wouldn't you know they they wouldn't talk to you know they wouldn't talk to the head units or they you know they would just stop working midway uh, oh, i won't mention the brand that i was having all of these frustrations <laughs> with but it was uh it was uh, it was quite an experience so it was it was really important was to that, have a back was that for us? It was yeah, not for i, I was no. gonna say andrew can set okay. you up with something better <laughs> <laughs> i already have i'm i'm waiting and this is not a we're not in any way sponsored by four eyes but i'm waiting for my second four eyes parameter as we speak it's uh canada post has it somewhere in the prairies so i'm I'm excited. Oh, good luck with that. <laughs> um, one really interesting point, though, that you bring up about reliability is quite often when you're training in a quiet environment, um, quiet from an RF standpoint, radio frequency standpoint, um, things will work properly. Hmm. So you'll connect no problem. You'll get good data, no dropouts. But as soon as you go to an event, um, and this is particularly in the indoor arena, um, which doesn't really affect triathlons as much, but uh, it is a problem for Cycling Canada, for example, and I suspect all the other Olympic teams. But you get into a condensed environment where everyone has a cell phone operating on 2.4 gigahertz. You've got Wi-Fi routers. You've got all this other electronics noise. Um, the time it won't work, it's not by coincidence, but the time it won't work will be during an event huh. because it is now concentrated with all this other noise. So that is when you will experience dropouts. So it's actually... Um, it seems like bad luck, but it's actually more, co or not coincidence, it's uh, just the different factors coming together in the wrong way. That's really yeah. interesting. But yeah, interesting. they are getting better, for sure. Um, the signals are stronger, battery life is better, but it's still a problem. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, what, one thing that I could add maybe on uh, on this note is that the Stride power meters, I do use one, and I think it's a good tool. And uh, primarily... I still prefer to use pace over power in most workouts, but actually the measurement of pace is a bit more accurate with a power meter compared to the GPS uh, measured uh, pace that you get to your watch. So, so if you want, and and also it's less sensitive to things like uh, yes. like RF noise and uh, especially things like going into tunnels or where you have very high mm -hmm. buildings around you and and so on. So if you want to really make your running pace measurements more accurate, then the stride power meter is something that could go on the list of of uh, good tools to have as well. I totally agree, especially in in like you said in in places where the the signal isn't great. And also, I found in uh, in technical trail running as well, where you have a lot of uh, uh, we have a lot of turns where you're doing switchbacks, for example, GPS will rob you of distance and therefore, you know, <laughs> slow your pace because it's not, uh, you know, the accuracy just isn't there. And they, maybe even the sampling frequency, cause it's, I think it's like, usually it's one second recording unless you, well, you should turn off smart recording. Here's your, here's your tip of the day listeners. If you're, for some reason, Garmin devices still come default smart recording, which is actually should be called dumb recording. Uh, from from a time when when Garmin memory was really really small and you didn't want large file sizes, so first thing you should do with any Garmin device is switch it to one second recording. But even a one second recording of your GPS signal, if you're doing um, tight switchbacks with kind of questionable maybe in the trees GPS accuracy, uh, you're probably going to get a little bit short short shrifted on uh, 
on the on the distance and and so therefore have a slower pace and like michael says with um with a stride power meter or even you know a garmin foot pod that's properly calibrated or any anyone else's foot pod that's properly calibrated you will get better pace data totally agree yeah. So with that in mind, um, so we've talked about, you know, data collection a little bit and the, and the, this, the internal and external power sensors. Um, Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the apps and the programs in that, that we have access to that, uh, uh, we can then use to analyze all of this useful data? Actually, can I interject quickly? Um, before we go into that, I would say, can we do a deeper dive on some of the metrics that have become available recently with some of the the base sensors? Um, so, for example, with power meters, you have there's left right balance, there's torque smoothness, effectiveness, all of these other metrics. With uh, with running pods, you can also get uh, I think it's with Garmin specifically the vertical oscillation, um, some of the other like ground contact time things like that. In your opinion, are these metrics useful for the average runner? Should they be used to track long-term changes like injuries or predict for injuries? Um, or do you see a purpose in looking at them from a day-to-day perspective? Short answer, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, I like I short answers that, like that. <laughs> uh, look at, yeah, look, look, look at the simple metrics. That, that's more than good enough. And uh, yeah, that's what I do too in my coaching. Because even for me, like doing this full-time, like it's very easy like yeah we have a little bit more bandwidth to look at more things but it's still very easy to get into paralysis by analysis and uh, i have tried to look at those and have tried to figure out well can i make some sort of uh, like more informed decisions on anything by looking at these uh, these metrics are they actionable and uh, i've talked to experts i have a an episode for example with uh, phd isi Moore, who has worked a lot on running mechanics and and uh, with metrics as well and uh, she said the same thing it's uh, for one thing the reliability isn't really there in the first place so it makes a little sense to look at them and that made me feel pretty good about <laughs> what i had had come to the conclusion with on my own that well i, I can't figure out these things like they, like there isn't any actionable information in them for me so yeah my answer is no those new and uh, like less evident met- metrics like that are not you know pace heart rate and so on are usually less valuable cadence can be important to to look at in in certain uh, in certain cases for sure but other than that the the running dynamics metrics no i wouldn't really look at them i'm really glad you said that because we've gotten feedback at four eyes from the pro teams that we work with that basically say they completely disregard it they don't have any uh they don't see any value in getting torque smoothness or even left right balance is a little bit uh questionable sometimes because there's not really that much you can do to change it um and if sometimes if you chase changes when your physiology is just biased towards one direction you can end up injuring yourself 100 percent. yeah yeah and uh, yeah i i got on track of talking about running uh, dynamics but yeah the, the exact same thing applies to to the torque smoothness and uh, and uh, pedal well pedal smoothness and uh, and left right balance and so on really i would say yeah the, there, there's no no real point tracking them and w- quite often people will ask me should i get a single or a dual sided power meter and while there may be other reasons for a dual sided uh, power meter that i'm sure you andrew are in a much better position to answer than i am but just from the point of getting more metrics, I think that there's absolutely no reason to go for a dual-sided power meter. So, so quite often I recommend a single-sided because it's obviously going to be cheaper. To be honest, uh, if anyone asks me directly, I'll just recommend a single-sided unless they, for whatever reason, specifically want the dual-sided just to kind of tick off that box and say, I've got both sides. But yeah, you can get most of the information you need from a single-sided. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I mean, the only kind of the only use case I would think for a two, dual-sided power meter, and I'm starting to change my mind on this, is is it was for aero testing when you need to know true power. Um, but then again, the errors in aerodynamic testing, and we'll talk about it later because it's kind of like my pet, you know, topic of conversation now. My favorite <laughs> thing to think about, um, given the errors in the in the in the other upstream devices there, or I don't know, maybe parallel stream devices there, uh, whether or not you're getting true power or close to true power, it doesn't really make that much of a difference unless you have a massive leg imbalance. Um, but for the sake of training, uh, which is where, where Michael started saying, you know, when he said that, that training is the real utility for all these sensors, I totally agree. A single sided power meter would, uh, would make perfect sense. 
Um, when we had Leomo on the show uh, a couple episodes back, they were talking about being able to um, being able to notice uh, fatigue, usually like some kind of neuromuscular fatigue, whether it's neurological or muscular, um, based on the changes in the, the quote unquote normal, um, dynamics of your legs and torso during a run. This is specifically during a run. Um, then you could, you could adjust training to, um, to then, you know, ideally cope with with that level of fatigue or you could catch it in your training and i think there's some there's some case to be made there's a case to be made for that uh but i put that firmly in the you know the marginal gains category of things mm -hmm. absolutely and and i would just say there, there are other ways to get around that uh, so one example that i use quite a lot is to include in some workouts let's use the bike as an example it's a, a simple one just have the athlete do a 20 second all out sprint at the end of the warm up mm -hmm. for a workout. So it's also part of the warm up still just a 20 second sprint. It's not going to do you any harm really to do that. But actually when you see that your 20 second sprint now is 100 watts lower than it was the last few weeks, then that can be a sign for fatigue, uh, either, uh, neuromuscular potentially probably more likely metabolic and just being low on glycogen, but either way it's a sign of fatigue and you can basically, what I'm saying is that uh, you don't necessarily need fancy metrics. You can do a simple test like that just to get power and they will tell you most of what you need to know. Yeah. I, I agree with that. That's, that's a good, that's a good way to slice it. That's a good way to, um, to, to, to sneak into it. And that's the beauty of, of kind of, you know, the evolution of the, the art of coaching is that you can with, with, the advent of uh, of more and more of these sensors, you're starting to realize that you can still get some of the some of the data that the new sensors promise by using the old data. A prime example is, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, um, and I haven't yet experimented with this with this software, um, but there's uh, I think they're now owned by Garmin. It's a package called AeroTune. Have you heard of it, Michael? Oh yes, uh, yeah. I remember interviewing the the founder uh, back in the day on that triathlon show. German guy, right? Like I don't yep. remember his name. Yeah, Sebastian. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so this is a really, a really a neat platform that I, I'm not going to speak about because I haven't tried it yet. So I don't know any, know very much about it, but it looks really cool that can do aero testing without any kind of, you know, aero meter. Yeah, def definitely. And that's something, well, as you said, you have talked about the aero sensors as well. Uh, I interviewed a few of them on, on your podcast. Uh, I think I have asked some people that are not from the companies themselves. I remember Dan Bigan, for example, mm -hmm. who is uh, one of the, uh, the well-known experts on aerodynamics has worked with uh, well, the Hub Watt bike in like or being a member and uh, leader of that uh, track team in the UK, but also has been a consultant with the Danish uh, team pursuit team that set the world record uh, relatively recently, the early this year, I believe. And uh, yeah, I asked him for example of his uh, his thoughts on them, and he said that well for for um, Purposes like the the Danish Team Pursuit team and uh, who bought bike were like really they looking for real real marginal gains. Then yeah, it makes all the sense in the world. But probably for most triathletes uh, or cyclists, uh, it's it's not yet a stage where it makes sense necessarily to invest in in those sensors. Aerotune uh, is definitely appealing in the way that you don't need to buy an expensive sensor. So although it's a long time since I've interviewed Sebastian and uh, I. I've heard a little bit of mixed mixed feelings of, or mis mixed feedback from how uh, how well it worked, but that was again a couple of years ago. So hopefully they've sorted out a lot sorted out a lot of kinks in how it works. So that could be potentially a really interesting thing to try to to get sort of real real world aerodynamics data that can actually be useful and actionable. Well, when Canada Post shows up with my power meter, because it's it's the power meter, it's the short crank power meter, the one for my for my triathlon time trial bike, I'll, I'm going to give it a whirl, Michael, and I'll uh, I'll let you know how it goes. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, do we want to talk about uh, recording and tracking systems? Yes, I fully derailed that conversation there. My apologies. <laughs> no, I think uh, I honestly, uh, Andrew, I think that was that was like an awesome rabbit hole because it was it, it's one of those things that uh, that's the kind of the whole point of having this conversation is talking about you know is this stuff useful and so is this proliferation of of new metrics is it useful? I think that's that was you know super topical. Yeah, and, and I think just to to wrap up that part. Like an, an overriding take-home message from this episode from from my side would be that to really 
there's always you can always improve your learning of how to use how to do the basics better how do you understand power better how do you understand pace better and understand and use how do you understand and use heart rate better yeah and uh, really investing in in learning that is going to pay much much more dividends than trying to learn to understand how to potentially use and potentially benefit from something like the running dynamics and uh, the power uh, power dynamics dynamic metrics whatever the 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 umbrella name for for that is so so really focus on on the big levers and and those things because there's, there's definitely always going to be a lot more to learn a lot more to to benefit from in even if they are quote unquote basic and a perspective from inside the industry there is that a lot of it is marketing fluff it's just things that are added for the sake of trying to sell more product to differentiate yourself right yeah, exactly. Yeah, because power meters, heart rate monitors, uh, a lot of the running dynamics have reached that point where there's really not much difference in terms of accuracy. There's not much difference in terms of battery life, and it's become almost a commodity item. So just add more features is the the only thing that can be done with marketing. Yeah, yeah, that make, makes a lot of sense. So uh, yeah, you wanted to talk about the um, so the tracking systems, the, the apps and stuff. What was that the next one? Yeah, let's let's talk about that. Let's also mention any kind of uh, analytics tools that then that take things like heart rate, power data, um, and then give you something useful. For instance, you know the obvious ones that come to mind would be Inside and Exert. Um, if you think of others, we can talk about them as well. As well as think platforms like you know Training Peaks or Today's Plan or any of the ones that you know that you have used uh, that you have experience with. Yeah, so I think one of the big ones that uh, that any athlete has to have is uh, some sort of training diary and i believe it makes sense to have it on one of these platforms like training peaks is a big one obviously yep i myself like training plan uh, tra- training peaks uh, the most i have to say i've tried a few different ones and the uh, training peaks is the one i i like the most but uh, really this is uh, i don't think there's anything wrong with any of the other ones either so uh, it's largely a question of personal preference which one you go for but you want some sort of platform where you can, or not necessarily a platform, even if it's physical training diaries, that's fine. As long as you can manage to keep things organized and not lose them and <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, so maybe Excel or Google Sheets or something would be a bit more modern than than physical training diaries. Either, either way, you want to log your training and uh, that includes things like your your perceived exertion in in the workouts that you did and some subjective comments and feedback on on how the workouts went so yeah really it makes sense to have have it on a platform like for example training peaks where you can just sync your data from your garmin and see all your power pace heart rate data and then just write your comments then and there and give some sort of rpe rating i think when you have that that's that really is uh, is a godsend for allowing you to to look back and see what has been going well, what has not been going well, are you progressing, are you stagnant, and make some informed decision about training moving forward based on based on what you're seeing in the in the grand scheme of things, looking at the the whole training block or the whole like a long more long term look back of all the training that you are doing. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's it's valuable. Obviously, if you're working with a coach, it's essential. Um, but even for self-coach athletes, it's, it is valuable for the, the very reasons that Michael outlined, that you have historical data and you have some ability to, you know, see where you were and see see what you're doing now. And uh, you can you can start drawing some, you know, some personal correlations between between how much training you did and how you performed in a race and what sort of training you did. And um, one thing that Michael said that was really, that's really important and I try to emphasize this with anyone I work with is, is adding your, your comments and adding your subjective, um, metrics like, well, like RPE mm-hmm. and, and how a workout felt. That's, that's critical. And that's something that, uh, I think I, it, it's funny because it's something that, that used to be the only tool. And then I, it feels like the pendulum swung completely the other way when, where things like subjective metrics became almost ignored by some coaches and, and, and everything went, uh, you know, uh, everything went to towards the what you can measure side of things but now subjective metrics are making a comeback and i'm very happy for that well there was probably an opinion where it was too variable and not hard data um but i would say that uh, it is very important and this is something i'm ad- admittedly terrible with uh but just actually recording the rpe of a workout and if anyone from garmin is listening or trainer road um if you can have it prompt as your workout finishes and as it 
saving to uh, to actually input that RPE in the moment when it's fresh, when you're still thinking about it, rather than the next time you sign into Training Peaks. Uh, that would be huge for me because I always forget to, and then by the time I look at it on Training Peaks, it's like multiple hours or a day later, and then I yep. have no recollection of what it actually felt like, unless it was really painful. Yeah, no, <laughs> the, it's true. You really. I think there's uh, there's some research that that has validated essentially the session RP scale and uh, what they say is that you should do it within 30 minutes or so after finishing the workout is so it makes sense too but and I understand it's and I know this from <laughs> experience coaching a lot of athletes that have difficulty doing this for for me it's just become a habit I do it right away and it's not really uh, not really difficult but yeah it's again you have to build that habit and and then once it sticks then then you you can bring it with you and and it becomes really valuable and i take full blame on that <laughs> that's completely my own failing but i yeah, suspect yeah. i'm not alone in that and this, no, you're this not is alone. maybe a, a bit uh, like a bit oracle for self coach athletes but one of my key charts really when i look, analyze an athlete's uh, training block whatever it is like the last month or so because i'm going to plan the next two weeks and i want to look at so what did we really do the last month what, one of the first things that i look at is a uh, a chart I built in WKO analytics software, which is a histogram of the RPE of all their workouts. So I can see sort nice. of where the distribution is and how many really hard workouts, perception, perceptionally really hard workouts did they do? How many really easy ones? Where is the average sort of, or and the median? And really to me, that's that says a lot because looking at a lot of athletes now, I, I have a good feeling for where it should be and definite and even more so I have a good feeling for where it should not be. So, uh, <laughs> so if, if it's where it should not be, then I know that we need to make some changes. No, that's an excellent point. I'll add a couple of quick things, um, to what, it, what Michael just said, uh, the, for, for, you know, for any kind of, um, anytime that, that, you know, we coaches want you athletes to, to do something, the easier it is, the better, the more streamlined it is. That's why I think, uh, Andrew's suggestion of having Garmin or, or trainer road or anyone else prompt you for RP right away is great. Cause then you don't forget it. Um, but the fact that, uh, that the integration between the platforms is so good now that your Garmin, any, as soon as you record, you know, stop and save your workout on your watch or your bike computer. And as long as you're within, you know, as long as you have a fairly modern one of those that, that has Bluetooth and talks to your phone, if you're within range of your phone and Garmin isn't, you know, hasn't been hijacked by, by Russian hackers, <laughs> Low blow. I know, I won't, I, I'm not going to let them forget it anytime soon. Um, <laughs> and then it shows up in training peaks or, or today's plan or, or, um, final surge or any of the other platforms that you, you choose to use. And then it works the other way too. So if you have a, you know, a structured workout that's built into training peaks that you did yourself or your coach assigned for you, it can then pop up on your Garmin and it's gotten to the point where it's seamless. And that, that just makes it, that makes the work anything that makes the workflow easier i think is a big win because there's already a you know a bunch of logistical challenges to training and anything that that removes those logistical challenges i think is a win and even if it's not you know even if it doesn't directly measure or do anything for you the fact that it makes it easier is is worth um noting and and giving a kudo to yeah totally uh, if uh, we talk a little bit about some other apps that potentially and platforms that potentially might be useful, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Inside, and uh, I'm, I'll be happy to talk about that. But I would actually categorize that not necessarily as a software, but as a testing procedure. And I have a note here about Good point. Uh, different tests, so maybe we can talk about that a bit later. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in terms of apps and software, I, I would say I was thinking about this, and for most self coach athletes, I would really not recommend uh wko golden cheetah and so on because even though yeah you can build some really cool charts and stuff and you well you have pre-built charts as well but i don't think that the add value of that really is uh, that the balance is there and the the, the, ben the return on investment is there for self-coached athletes because you already if you're using something like training peaks you already have a lot of kind of the the main charts that you need you can look at your volume week by week you can uh, even look at things like your your training stress score and uh, you can look at your peak power numbers over a given time period you can you can do quite a lot of things in training peaks and other similar platforms maybe not everything but you can do enough that again like the 80 20 for the self-coach athlete here is to like try to do 
with those basic tools the best that you can and there's probably still a lot of room for like learning to use those tools better or being more effective with how you use the data like how is it actionable for you how is it not just looking at charts and thinking hmm, this is nice but actually knowing what to do when you see certain things so so i would i would probably say that for most athletes athletes that are self-coached I, I wouldn't recommend WKO Golden Cheetah. I'd spend that time training instead of instead of looking at charts and building charts. Totally agree. I think um, well, first of all, you said eighty twenty, which is my like my favorite approach to life in general. <laughs> yeah, and for I mean, most yeah. of our listeners probably know this, but like the the kind of the very quick glib theory of this is that you know you get you get. 80% of the results through 20% of the effort and the, the remaining 20% take 80% of the effort. So I'm a big, I'm, I'm kind of lazy. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of that approach. And I think You're that- You're just time effective. Time effective. I'm very time effective. Um, <laughs> I like Michael's, uh, Michael's approach too. And I've used Golden Cheetah mostly because Golden Cheetah is the only thing that works for analysis with the Notio uh, aerometer. That's the only reason I pick, I have it, and I've used WKO four, and I agree. There's there's really there's there's some really fun nerdy things you can do with that with that software. But as far as like straight up utility or time value, or value for money or value for time, you know the time invested. I'm a hundred percent with you on that one. Yeah, it's just an invitation to get lost in the weeds. Really, that's the way I look at it. It, it really is, and and that's that's what I think is the big problem. It's not just that you potentially aren't using your time the most effectively but actually chances are that you forget focusing on the most important things because you have so many other things to look at so so actually there is a big chance that your training is becoming less effective by looking at too many of these tools rather than just focusing on more of the basics yeah totally agree with you the the conversation so far i think could be summed up in a few words saying pay attention to power heart rate pace and then log everything keep it simple yeah (laughs) comments subjective (laughs) subjective comments and feedback yeah yeah exactly yeah and uh and then in terms of other apps uh other than like in terms of training platforms i mean it really depends on how we classify things i mean we could talk about things like swift and trainer road and so on and uh i'm i guess those are a bit different so maybe not something that goes in the same category there are apps like HRV for training and and other tracking apps of different things exist. Where, where do you want to to go next? Let's uh, let's talk about let's talk about HRV and then we can uh, you know maybe we can because it is it's an app but it, it's a very it's an app with a very specific purpose and then we can talk about um, let's talk about uh, that together with things like you know you mentioned talking about Whoop and the Aura Ring and sleep trackers. I think it makes sense to lump all of those things together because it's an app but it's also a tool that helps you you know ostensibly track readiness to train or recovery or however whatever word you choose to to describe that aspect of uh, of training life balance yeah so let's why don't we go there so hrv i think is good but also i would advise some caution against getting too hung up on it i i think there is some interesting research i also think that it's not really sufficient yet to be able to say for sure that well we can train better when we are using hrv uh, i personally think that it's such an easy measurement to do one minute in the morning with hrv for training which i think is a great app that it's worth it even if like i pretty much never i it hasn't hasn't happened in a long time that i actually take action on the information but and that's mainly because my hrv seems to be very very stable and my resting heart rate as well so potentially but the the thing there the interesting thing there is that let's say that actually it starts to drop more significantly then of course there would be cause to maybe take action on it and and do something so so i guess that yeah i'm a bit biased there by my personal experience right now where it just has been very stable for a long time Mm -hmm. but but that being said i i wouldn't recommend for my athletes either and a lot of them i do recommend using hrv but I don't advise them to really take day-to-day actions based on their HRV, but uh, combine it really with how they're feeling. And if their HRV is in the red and they're really feeling crap, then okay, that might be a sign to a changed training for the day. But if just their HRV is red, I generally advise them to train and at least uh, take the 20 minute rule and do the 20 minutes of warm up with some of the main set uh, in it as well and see how th- things feel. And if everything feels good, then 
just go for it. So, so I'm a little bit hesitant to uh, to advise fully buying into HRV. This is based on some discussions that I haven't really had on air on the podcast, but I talked with some researchers about it uh, that have some uh, some some doubts about some of the research that has been positive around HRV. Interesting. So. Yeah, and and I honestly like even if I wanted to say what exactly it was, I can't really remember <laughs> some uh, <laughs> physiology mumbo jumbo, <laughs> I guess. No, but uh, I, I do think it's potentially a useful tool, but it's also somewhat limited, and we shouldn't necessarily put as much stock in it. It has been kind of trendy recently, so and I've also talked about it on the podcast. So, so I want to make it clear that it's not you know the. Uh, knight in shining armor that's going to save you from everything yes i don't think anything is for the sake for like my my point on this is like no, there's there's no there's no magic bullet out there um i'll share my experiences with hrv for training i and hrv in general um i generally agree with what you say that that it any kind of hrv data needs to be taken in context with other subjective you know, how you feel that day. Um, and I don't usually use it with my athletes. I don't use HRV to guide day-to-day training decisions. Uh, but what I do use it for is to, um, as a, as a check-in when something is going wrong, when I'm, when I'm seeing, uh, you know, signals from their subjective feedback or from their training performance that are not where I would expect them to be for those athletes that are tracking HRV, uh, then I'll I'll go in and see if there's you know it's, I almost treat it as like a as a second or third data point in that in my decision making, um, but what I will say for HRV for training and um, uh, we we had Marco on the show and uh, I I do have a subscription to the the pro um, account uh, for HRV for training and their analytics are really neat so the visualization of their trends and for those for those folks not super familiar with HRV. Um, it, as Michael mentioned, it's not really, it's not ideal to look at, you know, acute changes and by acute, I mean day-to-day changes. But if you're seeing shifts in trends, like the seven day moving average, uh, that's where, um, that's where maybe you want to start thinking about making decisions or making changes. But what I really like about their pro platform is that they have, they will plot the seven day moving average within a band of a, of a 60 day moving average. And I think the 60 day is like a one sigma, uh, uh, range. So 90, uh, one sigma or two, I think it's within, I actually don't know, but it's, it's some kind of, it's some kind of range of your 60 day moving average. Uh, and then the idea is if the seven day moving average is outside of that range, then that means that something is changing. And with HRV, the important thing, you know, it's good when it's not changing, when it's stable, like it is in Michael's case. Uh, so when I see that seven day average outside of that 60 day range that's when i you know that's when i usually have a conversation with the athlete because then then there could be stuff going on and again that's that's the, the that's the value that's in the the pro platform which is um which is the visualization of of that data yeah and then the the kind of the zoomed in acute data is i agree is is not as useful well you're you're using it exactly the way i'm using it i'm also uh, i do like to use that visualization and uh, exactly focusing on a seven day moving average and and not the day to day changes and and also looking at well like if something goes wrong then like taking a look at hrv in more detail well can can we see anything there or is this something that was starting to show before the athlete got sick or something like that uh so so yeah i mean i agree with with all of those points that you make and and also one thing to add there is that hre for training uh, does measure your resting heart rate as well when which is really useful to have because that's something the same people that told me about some of the potential limitations around hrv and relying on hrv said that resting heart rate is actually potentially uh a more reliable metric and i oh, think well <laughs> when you measure both of them then that's actually a really good thing to do because then you you might be able to to see changes in resting heart rate there that that might not show up in in hrv who's right and who's wrong I, honestly <laughs> i don't know uh, but but i do think that hrv for training as an app is really good to have it's something i would recommend people to get because even if it's not a big win necessarily like having that that ability to track your hrv and resting heart rate trend 
over time it it will allow you to maybe in the long term see some things that that uh, that really that that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise that okay this mm-hmm. training volume actually seemed to be a bit too much for me with my current work other workload and work life balance and so on because uh, be, because my HRV and resting my HRV was tanking and my resting heart rate was going up and so on so 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 I do think that that's a valuable app uh, but just should be treated as a tool in the toolbox really yeah just like just like most other things yeah um let's talk a little bit about sleep trackers and and um devices that measure live hrv like whoop and aura rings um i think i know what you're, what you're gonna say on this so maybe you know we can <laughs> yeah we can, we can, talk we can make it short and sweet i don't think there's any any value in in measuring live live hrv i think the morning measurement is um is really uh, more than adequate uh, it, there's no extra added value in measuring hrv during sleep or uh, all the time really sleep trackers um i mean i don't think that you need that i i don't first of all i don't think that the accuracy is always all that good second of all the main thing you should be tracking really is you you can use do with a watch and your own <laughs> sense of how well you slept so i do think and again that's where hrv for training is a really great app because it can be an all-encompassing sort of subjective health uh tracking tool because you can in the morning prompts you can you can set in the settings uh hrv for training to prompt you to write in your sleep duration so if you know that okay i went to bed at 10 fell asleep shortly thereafter and i woke up at six then you know that you slept for seven hours 50 let's say and you just add that in the app and that's your sleep tracking you know how long you slept and the other part of it is how well did you sleep and you just have this slider that goes from very bad to very good and uh, and you uh, place the slider where you felt that you slept and that's really all you need to know and there's actually uh, i had uh, a doctor uh, walter samuels from canada actually on the podcast a while ago and he was talking at length about these things and he said that yeah really the best sleep tracker is just having a journal on your nightstand and writing down how long you slept and how well you slept and that, that's everything you need he was quite critical and saying even that there are potential negatives uh, big po- big potential negatives of sleep trackers with anxiety around sleeping and and those sorts of things so so i really wouldn't recommend neither the live hrv uh, measurements or the like very fancy sleep trackers i don't think there's any value in them well, that's a point I actually wanted to bring up was just the observer's paradox where you actually influence the output by measuring it. So if you have a watch, some people find it uncomfortable to sleep with. So a less invasive method would be ideal. Um, and it's it's something that uh, you can get stressed out about. You can think, you can look at your, your sleep data and it can influence how you feel just because the number isn't what you're expecting. So it can lead to a bunch of additional stress and it's uh, it's really a challenge to deal with so the data may be doing more harm than good agreed just the way you feel rather than what this device with questionable either (laughs) questionable data collection and questionable you know algorithms is is telling you yeah Yeah, and it's mostly just not a transparent calculation with body battery yeah it's totally black box yeah yeah what influences it how does it get better why does it improve significantly some days when i'm sitting around and other days it doesn't seem to improve so Mm -hmm. and and the same applies to things like whoop the same applies to a lot of the other garmin metrics that we didn't mention before but that we could mention as well the recovery advisor and those sorts of things are also (laughs) that do not use them Yes, please don't. There, I, I have those. I have those questions all the time. You know, what people are were, were saying. You know, why is my, you know, why is my Garmin VO two max dropping all of a sudden? I'm like, there's like fifty reasons. Did you have a cup of coffee so your heart rate's higher? Is it hot outside? You know, are you a little bit tired so your heart rate for the same pace is higher? So now Garmin thinks that your your fitness is beginning, and then I'll also tell you that your fitness is also declining. It's it's a it's a very I think it's it's a pretty toxic. Um, it's a toxic metric. I'm, yeah, I'm not a fan of all those other Garmin things. What's really interesting is when I get the highest VO2 max is when I'm most fatigued because my heart rate is low. Heart rate's low. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So that's, what, that's how it totally works. Backwards. Um, and yeah, it just seems like we're kind of taking multiple pot shots at Garmin here for <laughs> Sorry, all the Garmin. metrics that they've uh, introduced <laughs> as well as the, uh, the data scandal. <laughs> I, I guess that's the first bit is behind a lot of those, uh, those algorithms. So, so we have to 
take a photo at, at first meet and actually <laughs> I can take it. But now Garmin owns them, so why don't we can still we well, can yes, still true, fire. true, true. But but on that note, I find that the calorie calculations as well that are based on largely on heart rate are completely inaccurate. When when I go for a run, for example, I get way low calorie estimates compared to what yeah. I know I'm burning because it's fairly simple to calculate a good estimate of how many calories you're burning is simply your body weight in kilograms times the number of kilometers you ran. So mm -hmm. today, for example, I ran 20.5 kilometers or so. So it's roughly 1400 calories, but because my Garmin used uh, my heart rate to calculate uh, calories, it said that it was something like 900. So if, <laughs> if I didn't know better than trust that, I would get my, uh, my eating potentially totally wrong. I think it does a better job on the bike because I think it actually uses power and then... Yes, yeah, getting... on the bike it uses power. So yes. that's closer that's... because then it's like, you know, if you're saying you're 20, roughly 25% efficient, mechanical efficiency, then you're you're quite a bit closer on the bike. Oh, yes, yes. You're, on, the, on the bike, you're very close if you have a power meter. That, yeah, so that's a power not, meter. not a problem yeah. at all. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Um, sorry, Garmin. We, we love you. I love you. I mean, I use all, I'm all Garmin across the board. I even, I, I'm a Garmin, uh, official Garmin dealer too. So I should, maybe I shouldn't be taking, taking all these shots at Garmin. So the, the positive that I will bring up is that sometimes you have to take a leap. Sometimes you have to introduce things that aren't perfect and knowing they're not perfect. Good point. And then that feedback that you get from the users is what pushes it to the point where it does become useful or it does become reliable. So it's it's not necessarily a bad thing that they're pushing this out. It's just I think there's maybe too much reliance on some of the metrics. So if people go into it knowing that this is something that's not accurate or something that, that maybe I should look at other things in addition to whatever they're providing body battery or sleep, then they'll go in with their eyes open. They'll go in with a much better perspective. And then Garmin will get, or whoever's introducing the data field will get feedback and they'll improve it over time and it will become useful eventually. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. No, that's a good point. You're, 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 you're never going to, you know, roll out, you know, a, a beta perfect product, right? Like you're, it's, it's always going to be a work in progress. I think, yeah, I think the, the, the question is, is in education, and, uh, you know, Garmin's obviously not going to tell you that some of these metrics are questionable <laughs> because that's what's the point of having the metrics. So they're, you know, their marketing, their marketing objectives are different than perhaps our coaching objectives. Um, so it's important, I think, to, yeah, to, to, to put these things in context. Yeah. Well, that's uh, why podcasts such as this that are free and available for everybody uh, are really, really valuable because they bring this information out to people and i mean it's very difficult for because not everybody can be as invested in endurance sports as we are we all work in the industry yes. so so it's easy for us to sit there and say that well we know that these things don't work but but uh, it makes sense that pe a lot of people trust the metrics that garmin produces because i mean they they're giant in the industry so why wouldn't they know how much recovery you need so but, mm -hmm. but that's where yeah again uh, good that podcasts like this exist so that uh, there's a channel to get some information out to to athletes agreed agreed jumping back to uh software and uh and platforms i just want to mention S strava because it's been it's it's always kind of pissed me off um i'm i'm not a strava fan i'm on it mostly because of you know for like just the same reason i'm on facebook i guess um but i think for 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 athletes who have who have specific goals of you know events or certain fitness metrics that they're trying to hit, I think Strava can be the the exact opposite of what you're of what you need in life. Um, you know because it forces you to chase um, metrics and performances that are often counterproductive. I know when I was uh, when I had the studio and I had a bigger coaching roster, I had a a group on Strava that then I you know stopped administering because basically people were just competing on who can get the most hours in the group, which was the absolute worst thing you could possibly do. And I mean, that's my failing that I couldn't put a stop to it, even though I tried. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry, Strava. I'm not a fan of you. It's not that you care. It's <laughs> it's 100% in my view anyway it's 100% social media just like is, Facebook yeah, or Instagram totally. where you're you're showing vacation pictures and look how happy I am um it's the same look thing with Strava where you yeah look at my KOM look at my 20 minute power PB not look at my recovery workout like half the people probably don't even post their recovery workouts because they wouldn't be proud to show it off because it's not impressive numbers and that's not what you should be looking for in terms of some kind of activity tracking 
Yeah, and I think that it's important to clarify that well, we clarified at the beginning that we're talking about mostly self-coach athletes here, but but also I think it's clear to all of us, but we haven't mentioned it, that we're talking about athletes that still are interested in performance to some extent. They want to improve yes. their fitness, maybe do the next their next race faster than they did last year and so on. So obviously, if you're just somebody who enjoys to go out for a ride or a run every now and then, then you don't need training peaks or any training diary either you can just go out and do train whenever you like so 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 it's a completely different and then strava can be nice as well because you're not chasing performance necessarily but if yeah if you are an athlete that wants to improve your performance then 100 uh, percent it uh, can be very detrimental to to your performance i think and yeah i would i don't really I, i'm on it as well but i never log in i, I my yeah. uh, workouts just sink there somehow and i, yeah, I have no idea what's going on there <laughs> so a bit of a funny story is um, I was auto posting to to Strava um, without realizing it, and what was happening was I was doing these uh, steam showers to do like heat acclimation, and when I would save it, it would show up as nighttime activity. Um, so I had all these nighttime activities posted on Strava. <laughs> People were commenting like, "What are you actually doing in these nighttime activities?" <laughs> None of your business, Strava. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's good. Um, want to want to jump to um, testing, Michael? Because I think that's yeah, that's yeah, a let's, really let's that. valuable, I think, category. Yes, yeah, definitely. If if you are uh, looking to improve your performance, then getting some sort of information about your physiological makeup and uh, where you are in terms of your, in particular, here we're talking about some sort of metabolic testing. Uh, then that that can be hugely valuable. Of course, it's uh, to some extent dependent on how well you are able to utilize that information. And uh, if you are, uh, depending on who you're working with to do the testing, it might be a lab, it might be a remote testing provider in the case of, for example, inside testing, then you might get the information you need to to help tailor your training a bit to according to the test results. But generally speaking, some sort of metabolic testing, and by that uh, I mean, for example, a good lactate test or a good uh, VO2 test and, or uh, an inside test, which is a software-based test, or it can be a software-based test at least on the bike uh, that you can you can do at home. Those are all uh, good options. With the lab-based options, uh, well, first of all, one question I get a lot is, uh, can I buy a lactate analyzer and test myself? Uh, I don't recommend that. I think that uh, it's very difficult to test yourself, especially on the bike, because you <laughs> preferably should uh, take the sample from your earlobe and not from your finger because of grabbing the handlebars. So you really, I mean, if you train somebody in your household to test you or you have a training group or training friends that can help test each other and you can train together to to be very confident in taking the samples then sure but it's a bit of a learning curve so it's i would say it's better to go to a very reputable and a good lab and uh, obviously the same goes for a vo2 test where you have to have like some some pretty expensive equipment mm -hmm. but that being said i would also say that there are a lot of labs unfortunately and this is one of my biggest pet peeves I do not know why there exists so many labs that do testing so poorly. This really, uh, really steams my nuggets, so to say. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> I have not but, heard that expression before. <laughs> no, it's, it's, like it's, it's, not, it's not a real expression, but I got it from a podcast. <laughs> so I started using it. Uh, I like it. I, th I think it was somebody trying to say grinds my gears, but they didn't Steam remember what, yeah, what the actual expression was. So they said steams my nuggets. Uh, Love it. Anyway. Uh, yeah, like if you go to a lab test for for a lactate for to a lab for a lactate, lactate test, and they say that your threshold is at four millimoles, just like that, by arbitrary <laughs> arbitrarily, then for everyone, that, that's not correct, unfortunately, or you don't know that that is correct there. So that is not a good lab. So you should ask them maybe a bit about their methods and so on. And the same thing I would say just around the testing protocol before you decide on a lab. Ask them about their protocol and one of the. One of the most, one of the first things when it comes to lactate testing that you should ask about is the how long are the steps? And if they're, they're just three minutes, I would say that that's too short. Four minute, I would say is probably okay. Although there are also people that would say that that's still on the short end. They want to do five minutes. Five minutes, yeah. Uh, I know Inigo San Milan would like to do ten minutes. <laughs> that's 
maybe oh, a bit excessive for amateur yeah, athletes. That would be a painful test. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the, the Norwegians do six minutes, I think. So, um, but yeah, I mean, four, five minutes is great. Four minutes, I think, would be acceptable. But less than four minutes, I, I wouldn't recommend. This is when you're taking blood lactate, actually. Yes, That's it. blood That's, lactate. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then a, a step test uh, or, or an in- graded incremental, a uh, graded exercise test with the VO2 is good. There, there are different protocols there. And to be honest, I can't remember. There is some meta-analysis about which protocols might be the best, whether it's 30-second steps or one-minute steps. Uh, it, I, I think that in that case, it really comes down more so to the equipment rather than the actual protocol still. Like, do they have... Is it a gym that has bought a cheapy, yeah. <laughs> uh, like VO2 analyzer, or is it an yeah. actual human performance lab that has a has good equipment? So you can ask about that. So where where does this your piece of equipment sit on the range from low end to high end, and those would be some some things to look for. I remember seeing somewhere it could have even been you know it could have been inside that was telling me this. So that you know <laughs> they obviously have skin in the game, but the fact that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the metabolic carts, the ones that do the, the VO2 max testing and the, the gas exchange testing, they're incredibly susceptible to temperature and, uh, your results can be widely off based on the, the temperature of the actual test chamber. And of course they're, they are, uh, you know, climate controlled on the inside of the, of the device itself. But if they, if it's miscalibrated, it can be completely out to lunch. So the calibration of these units, even the very high, very high end ones is, is critical too. So that goes to your point of, you know, using a, a reputable lab that knows what they're doing and not maybe, you know, just somebody who bought one on eBay, um, yeah. Now says they're a they're a, a, a metabolic testing facility. Yeah, I did not know that about the temperature. That's really interesting. A- another thing that came to mind uh, when you said that is uh, was a case that you know of very well. I know as well uh, an athlete uh, that uh, went to do a lactate uh, lactate test, and there was no fan in uh, in the test room <laughs> on a summer day, and yes, and obviously yes. like that's that's not very good like you're going to get completely different you're, uh, you're, yeah. you're going to want to get heart rate zones from a lactate test and if you're you do that without a fan in indoors then that's going to be horrible one more thing on the uh, on the gas exchange test though that i want to mention as well uh, in terms of the protocol uh, you're going to get uh, a metric when you do a test like this that is your your map your max aerobic power yep which is uh, basically your uh, the highest one minute power that you that you held and that's going to vary uh, widely depending on the protocol. So while your VO2 hopefully should be fairly similar, uh, regardless of whether the ramp was 30 seconds or one minute, that maximum aerobic power can be very different because of the different amount of energy you uh, expended uh, before you reached your VO2 plateau, uh, so to say, mm-hmm. and your ex- and reached exhaustion. So. Keep that in mind that when you go, when if you test and you do another test but with a different protocol, then that's not comparing apples to apples. Even with the VO2 itself, uh, there is probably going to be some difference, and then you need to look it up. But uh, definitely things like the maximum aerobic power, uh, potentially things like VT1 and VT2, the ventilatory thresholds or lactate thresholds, might be impacted as well. So, really, uh, the ideal impacted the ideal by the protocol would, that you follow. Sorry. Yeah, you're saying they're going to be VT1, VT2 could be impacted, and uh, VO2 max could be impacted by the protocol. Well, you I don't, it? I don't know, I don't uh, have data on this, but I imagine that they could be a little bit, yes, uh, potentially, okay. uh, just because I mean, when you do something differently, because the VT1 and VT2 in those tests are uh, defined in a certain way, and depending on how you reach reach those uh, different like physiological levels they might just end up at slightly different levels i don't think they would be hugely impacted but they but if you see a 15 watt 10 15 watt difference it might actually not be any different uh, difference at all because it's within the margin of error from the different right. protocols but at the end of the day you're trying to have these things pegged to power or heart rate anyway right like you're trying to yeah you know you 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 the, the utility of doing these tests is to get some kind of you know idea of training intensities, whether they're heart rate based or power based, right? Absolutely. But if you do one test and then you do the next test, and in reality your VT two, for example, has increased by fifteen watts, but you get the same number, uh, the same mm. VT two, because the test protocol is different, then that can be a confounding factor. So the ideal scenario would be that you find a really good reputable lab that does things right, have the right protocols and the right equipment. 
And then you do the same, the test there every time in the same way with the same equipment, same power meter, same hardware monitor, right. and uh, all those things. It make it very repeatable when yeah. you do testing. Repeatability is key. Andrew and I have talked about this in length. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's where, of course, inside testing is really good because then you can do it at home with just your own power meter and your own you can control the fans and not have any uh, unfortunate <laughs> situations without fans and so on. And, uh, and it's very easy. Like it's very repeatable. It, that's, that's one of the main key things about that test. And, and also it's, uh, I, I think that it's uh, really, really good in terms of accuracy and precision. As long as you get everything out of yourself in those time trials, which admittedly <laughs> require some work, but it's not that difficult because time trials aren't too long. The longest one is, can be as short as 10 minutes or, or 10 to 12 minutes, then, uh, then you're good to go and your data is going to be, to be good. So, so I think, well, personally, uh, I'm, I'm a bit biased. I, I offer that as a service, but, uh, but I do think that that's the, uh, that that's the best test also because you get some additional physiological metrics and maybe we don't want to go too deep into a rabbit hole here, but that you, you <laughs> that's get a some, deep rabbit. Some, that's its own, that's its own episode. Yeah, I think, Michael. yeah. You get some information that you don't get from, from other tests. I agree. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the inside testing too. I think that you are, you said it. Like as long as you as long as you can get you yourself or you the coach getting your athlete to do it to do it uh, to do it all out to do it to do it well, um you do get some really really neat and uh and actionable uh data from it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a more it's more complete strength weaknesses profile than than any other test you can do. That's uh, that's I guess the big advantage, I think. It's not, it's not that the zones are better or anything like that. It's just you get a better picture of what your strengths and weaknesses are and better information for what might make sense to train. Got it. Agreed. Um, we have a little bit of time left because uh, I know Andrew has to jet. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about aero sensors? We've mentioned them quickly, but I just want to kind of put a fine point on it and then we'll, uh, we'll do our wrap up. Yeah. So I don't have any personal experience with them and uh, neither does any of my athletes really. So... Uh, yeah, what I'm going on is a little bit about from the conversation, well, from what I've heard from your guests on your podcast and from my conversations with some people in the, in the biking world, both in a coaching and aerodynamic consulting role and, uh, in, including Dan Bigham, for example. So generally, I think that probably the on bike sensors are a bit oracle for most, uh, self coach athletes, uh, at this point in time. But aero testing in itself, I think, can be really, really valuable. Uh, like, well, things like uh, Andrew's virtual wind tunnel, I have some experience with, and I think that's uh, really great. And uh, then we have we have some we have velodrome testing. If you can find a good uh, test provider that can have you tested on the velodrome, I think that's brilliant. Uh, let's see what Michael finds out about aero tune. That could be a potential <laughs> good test with without having to have an expensive aero sensor uh, so uh, fingers crossed for that and uh, generally speaking just a bike fit in general like you can if you go to a good bike fitter that takes into account all the facets of bike fitting including comfort power production and aerodynamics then you can get some really good sort of free wins by them just eyeballing you and it's not of course as as objective as measuring something but it can still be valuable and the the one point i'll add to that is a lot of this is purchased speed so you can get components that are more expensive you can get the bike fit does tie into the training because you need to adapt to a position but many of the changes are are things that you don't need to train or work into your training quite as much um but the probably the most valuable thing would be just taping a note on your handlebars that says, keep your head down or <laughs> something like that. And like if that, cause I know your mind, especially in long races, your mind can wander and you just lose focus. And regardless of how much arrow testing you do, that focus is not improved by knowing that your CDA should be X. Um, instead, it's just your ability to maintain that and practice train or like train with that position remind yourself constantly that you need to be in that position and that will be 95 percent of the benefit there that's that's a really excellent point and i will definitely use that with my athletes in our uh, in our coaching relationships cheapest speed you'll ever buy is a piece of yep. piece of masking tape on your bars i think you guys are spot on as far as uh, as far as your thoughts on aero sensors i don't think that the individual certainly not coached sorry certainly not a self coached athlete um, there's it's, it's really really hard to make the argument for purchasing one of these at the moment 
um, for coaches and for teams, especially if you've got a bit of a squad, um, there, there can be value if you really know what you're doing. And I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, Chris Morton, uh, Chris Morton and, uh, Aero Lab are going that way. They're not going direct to consumer at all. They're going direct to coaches and teams. Um, and it sounds like he's got a really cool product, but I agree at this point, it's not the, the data isn't quite, isn't there to support um, support using these devices. And even, and and even when, even when they do get better, they would be used for testing and not, not as day-to-day things. So, you know, originally no show, and I know they moved away from this. So this was, this is old information. Originally they were, they were billing themselves as being useful for racing. And I think in that case, they really aren't useful. Um, if anything, there could be distracting, but as a testing tool, there's value. I just don't know how you know, whether or not it's, it's, it's worth the money at this point, the old kind of, you know, slow twitch eyeball, uh, eyeball wind tunnel that, that Michael mentioned that one, as silly as it sounds, there are some like some very low hanging fruit that are very obvious. You know, if you're sitting totally upright, you know, there's obviously some wins there or obvious, or if you're not riding an arrow, that's, that's kind of a no brainer, but it's, it's remarkable how often you see people, especially in longer races, sitting up on their bars on, you know, not on climbs, but on flat sections. And, you know, you're just, you're just blowing that, uh, blowing those Watts into the wind. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I kind of fall in the same, in the same place. As far as AeroTune, um, as I said, I've had zero personal experience, but the individual who turned me on to it is, uh, is an engineer at Look in France. Um, and he says he's, he's done a lot of testing and compared it to, to Noshio in the velodrome and he can get very consistent results between the two. So he, you know, this is, this is Pierre, uh, who we mentioned on our last podcast, who, who, uh, submitted a correction to something we said earlier on. Um, so his experience, again, I have no personal experience. This is Pierre's experience in the velodrome with AeroTune compared to Noshio. Uh, he was getting fairly consistent results with the two. So for the, for ease of use, he, he uses, uh, AeroTune for the most part now. Yeah, that's cool. Consistency is probably the most important thing with any one of these tools. Consistency is key. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more tool on kind of an, a similar reign to the testing, performance testing and uh, aerodynamic testing is uh, video analysis in terms of technique and in particular on the swim. So mm-hmm. this would be a final really good tool, which while well, you could look at it in two different ways, it could be either uh, just getting a professional swim video analysis with somebody. And that's something that I would highly recommend that you do and uh, just, again, look for a really good service provider that know what they're doing. And even if it's a bit more expensive, it's going to be worth it to go to the best one, uh, I believe. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, worth doing. But also potentially getting investing in a GoPro. And especially if you have a few triathlon friends, then uh, maybe even split the costs and then you can film each other. And uh, I would recommend getting one of these sort of poles uh, i can't remember Man- manfredo uh, uh, pod manfredo pod is, is one the one that i use for uh, filming so that you can film you can you can hold it above the swimmer when they're swimming and you're walking next to them on the pool deck you can stick it down in the water you can get underwater footage and uh, and so on and basically i think that there are four really important angles and it's the bird's eye, eye view so from above the swimmer uh, there's from the side view okay. from above the water and the side view from uh, underneath the water and then there's the frontal view and uh, from especially underneath the water is the is the important one there i would say so uh, if you can get a video analysis with those four views or maybe even invest in a gopro and film have somebody film you and uh, maybe return the favor for your triathlon buddy then uh, that's going to be a, a very, very good, good tool to, to use. For a bit of comedy, um, I wonder what my form actually looks like right now. I haven't been in the pool since February, so um, it would be interesting to see, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, <laughs> it's quite humbling the first yep. five, six weeks. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm finally this week, I think I'm in my sixth week of swimming. And uh, this week, I'm finally starting to feel that... Uh, okay, I'm I'm getting somewhere, but the first five weeks were actually pretty pr- pretty horrible in terms of <laughs> I didn't expect I did I expected it to be bad, but I didn't expect it to be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
those of you those of you who know me in the way that I train know that I don't swim train. I basically start swimming three weeks out of a race <laughs> because I just I'm still pressed for time and swimming is my least favorite. And it's like it's the worst thing to do. I mean, it's it, I would never advocate this for anyone I coach. You know, this is a do as I say, not as I do kind of segment. But um, I basically jump in the water for three days a week, like, you know, maybe a month out and do a couple of open water swims. And my swims are very ordinary. I, like my swim times are nothing, nothing to write home about. I'm kind of like maybe better than mid pack. Um, and then I catch a lot of people on the bike. <laughs> that's kind of that's my game. But it's funny that you say, Michael, that you say, you know, the first five, six weeks are rough. I don't think I've ever gotten over that hump. <laughs> I've never in, in maybe four, not since my kids were born, not since my first kid was born. Have I swam for more than <laughs> more than six weeks before? Or in any kind of uh, consistent way uh, in yeah. a year. There could be a front of the pack swimmer buried inside you somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always tell myself like, this is my year to, to learn to swim really well. And then, you know, uh, history repeats itself. Well, well, if, if you are going to take that up as a project, be sure to have a GoPro and uh, have some swim yeah, videos. I have a stuff. GoPro. I just, and uh, I've got lots of friends. I'm sure, I'm sure that that's something yeah. I can do. Michael, this was awesome. Thank you so much for uh, for offering up your time and coming back on the show. It's always uh, it's always a treat to talk to you um, and uh, and get your insight on things. Yeah, this was uh, really fun and I think uh, a very important topic. So happy to uh, to contribute. Awesome. Um, the usual question: uh, If people want to learn more about uh, the podcast or your coaching services, what's the best way to get a hold of you to find you? scientifictriathlon.com is where you can find everything including the podcast and all the show notes for the episodes or if you're just looking for the podcast in your podcast app then you can just type in that triathlon show and you'll find it yeah i mean plus one or maybe I, by now it's plus two or plus three for the for that triathlon show uh it's de- it's definitely one of my go-to uh educational tools for triathlon i always learn something new when i listen to the show so big fan here Thanks. And listeners, thank you very much, as always, for tuning in. Uh, If you enjoy the show, tell your friends. uh, Tell them what you learned. This is something that I stole from John Thornham, whose whose show will be on very soon. I like that. I like that uh, that exit that he does. You know, tell them tell them what you learned today. Um, And of course, rate review us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, just a quick reminder, we've uh, switched to Patreon for uh, financial support. So if you really like the show, head on over to patreon.com slash endurance innovation. Uh, the link will be in the show notes to uh, throw us a couple of dollars to help us make the show. Thanks as always. So I hope that you enjoyed that a republished interview. Uh, as usual, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com and you can find links, including links, of course, to the Endurance Innovation Podcast, which I recommend you subscribing to and listening to. They have plenty of great episodes on there. Uh, I'll also link to my past episodes on the Endurance Innovation Podcast because uh, I've been on there twice before. On Thursday, we have another Q&A coming out as usual. And then next Monday, I publish uh, a Q&A interview that I did with Phil Bird, who is back for his second appearance on the podcast. And the topic, of course, is bike fitting. But uh, we will cover as many questions as possible submitted by you, the listeners that uh, have sent in questions through social media or email when uh, I sent out requests for questions for this interview. So it's a kind of a new format, an interesting format, and I hope that you will enjoy it. If you are looking for training plans or coaching services to take your triathlon performance to the next level, go and check out scientifictriathlon.com. There's uh, tons of information there. And if you need any further information, don't hesitate to email michael at scientifictriathlon.com. And that's Michael with a K to get uh, even more information. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take their free online sweat test and get a personalized hydration strategy for your training and racing and get 15% off your order of electrolytes with the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, dry suits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear and prescription glasses and sunglasses and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.